It's been over 20 years since the assassination of the DRC's former president, Laurent Desiree Kabila, at the hands of his child soldiers. Kabila was the leader of the rebellion that overthrew President Mobutu of Zaire in 1997 and restored the country's name. What many don't know about him is how he spent most of his life in exile, engaged in the illegal gold and diamond trade as well as wild schemes to overthrow the dictatorship of Mobutu, his immediate predecessor. Along the way, he briefly recruited Che Guevara in 1965, as well as the armies of Uganda and Rwanda, which helped bring him to power in 1997. In this episode of African Biographics, we'll look at the life story of Laurent Desiree Kabila, the former president of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, who was assassinated by his child soldiers. Laurent Desiree Kabila was born in the province of Katanga, a part of what was then Belgian Congo. This was in 1939. He completed his studies in high school in Elizabethville, now Lubumbashi, in the DRC, and then studied political philosophy at a French university. It is also said that Kabila attended the University of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. In 1960, when he was 21 years old, Kabila became a leader in the political movements allied to the first Prime Minister of Independent Congo, Patrice Lumumba. At the dawn of Congo's independence from Belgium, the young Kabila was one of the bright young men who may have become a star in his country's politics at the time. Yet after the United Nations intervention and the assassination of Patrice Lumumba, the cream of these young Congolese politicians were exiled. The army also chased Kabila and other communist sympathizers away into the bush where they formed a guerrilla force. These young Congolese then formed a rebellion which was then backed by both the Chinese and the Russians and a half dozen other African countries. The rebellion by this group of fighters including Kabila attracted the attention of the United States. The United States was panicking about possible Soviet gains in newly independent Africa. The Americans recruited Belgian officers, exiled Cuban pilots, as well as foreign mercenaries. Forced to retreat, Kabila and his friends turned to the Cubans and Che Guevara for support. So Che Guevara and his squad arrived on the Tanzanian-Congo border with a small contingent of guerrilla fighters. This was in April of 1965. However, in his diary that was published in 1999, Che Guevara noted Laurent Kabila's lack of involvement in the party and the general lack of organization in the group. Guevara judged Kabila, who was 26 years at the time, as not being the man of the hour and that Kabila was too distracted. This, in Guevara's opinion, accounted for Kabila showing up days later times to provide supplies, aid or backup to Guevara's men. Guevara also discovered, to his dismay, that Kabila was given to drinking traditional portions that he believed would protect him from bullets, and sometimes Kabila also turned up quite drunk. The revolt of the rebels that were led by Kabila was suppressed in 1965 by the Congolese army with support from the United States. Mobutu took control of the nation in 1965, established a dictatorship, and in 1971 renamed the country Zaire. In 1967, Kabila founded the People's Revolutionary Party, fighting to establish a self-sufficient Marxist territory in the eastern section of Zaire. This group carved out an enclave on Lake Tanganyika in the distant Kivu province. There, Kabila's rebels supported themselves by killing elephants, trading in ivory, as well as gold mining. They also received occasional help and funding from China and Cuba. But Kabila's rebels also gained international notoriety in 1975 when they kidnapped two American students and one Dutch researcher for ransom. Mobutu, who was now firmly in control of the country, ordered his troops into the region and they managed to suppress Kabila's forces who had no choice but to relocate to Tanzania where they regrouped. In the 1970s, Kabila moved his family to Tanzania after years of leading the unsuccessful rebel movement in Congo. At that point in time, Laurent Desiree Kabila was a wanted man, and the Kabila family would go on to live discreetly in exile in Uganda and Tanzania. While in Tanzania, 
Kabila's family members used assumed names, often versions of one of Laurent Kabila's pseudonyms, Francis Mtwale, and ran several small businesses, including restaurants, bars, and markets. Kabila and his family imported food and imported and exported other commodities from the Congo through the ports in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. The family was protected by the Tanzanian government and moved from house to house in the city's affluent neighborhoods to escape detection by Mobutu's intelligence agents. In 1979, when the Ugandan exiles, supported by Tanzania, decided to overthrow Idi Amin Dada, Kabila was incorporated by the Tanzanian troops among several armed groups to get a first-hand experience of modern warfare. According to Ugandan exiles, Kabila stayed in Uganda and became close to the group of Yoweri Museveni until they went to the bush in 1980. In Kabila and Museveni's first meeting, Kabila is said to have asked for arms in order to attack Mobutu, but was given a condition which was not to operate on the Uganda-Congo border. Unfortunately for Kabila, the arms deal fell through, but Museveni gave Kabila a modest financial contribution and linked him with Libya to see if they could assist in any way without involving Uganda. Meanwhile in Tanzania, Kabila would have a falling out with the then-Tanzanian president, Julius Nyerere, because of their disagreement over Kabila's lifestyle. Nyerere criticized Kabila for being too autocratic in his guerrilla movement and being too involved in illicit business activities, which later led to Kabila being cut off for contacts with the Tanzanian security services. At the time, by 1985, while Kabila was living in Dar es Salaam, he had been involved in smuggling gold and diamonds as well as timber on Lake Tanganyika. His other businesses included running a bar as well as a brothel in Tanzania. After all of this drama, Kabila disappeared from the public view for the next 15 years and did not re-emerge until 1994. So Kabila only surfaced again in 1994 when the Rwanda Patriotic Front, the RPF, took power in Rwanda. Ugandan President Yoweri Museveni introduced Kabila to the then Rwandan Vice President, Paul Kagame, who had a sharp conflict with President Mobutu. Kagame was cross with Mobutu over the presence of Rwandan refugees on the Rwandan-Congo border who were being held hostage by inter Hangwe militias who were Hutu militiamen that had led the genocide back in Rwanda, as well as elements of the former Rwandan army and the former Rwandan government. The presence of the inter Hangwe in Congo, as well as Mobutu's continuing support for his old Hutu allies, sowed the seeds of much of the upheaval that was to come and the Zairean leader's own downfall. The inter Hangwe and former Rwandan government officials used the refugee camps in the Congo as bases to launch attacks against the new government in Rwanda. By 1996, Rwanda decided that it could no longer tolerate the refugee camps. The Tutsi of South Kivu in Zaire, who were called the Banyamulenge, staged an uprising in the summer of 1996 against Mobutu's government. This was with support from the government in Rwanda. By the second half of 1996, the alliance of the Banyamulenge, as well as the Tutsi of North Kivu, Kabila's rebels, Rwanda, Uganda and Angola, formed to overthrow Mobutu. The alliance appointed Laurent Desiree so here are the reasons why the different countries and the different groups supported Kabila. Uganda apparently supported him as a means of eliminating Ugandan opposition groups on the Congo-Zaire border and perhaps to also punish Mobutu. And in the case of Rwanda, as I said earlier, they wished to eliminate the Hutu refugee forces in Zaire and perhaps to punish Mobutu. The Angolan government, meanwhile, was motivated by a wish to punish Mobutu as well as to strike a blow against its opponents, who were the separatist groups in the Congo, as well as Jonas Savimbi's UNITA. So Kabila was chosen as a spokesperson and the leader of the coalition, probably in part because he was the oldest among the founders of the AFDL, but more importantly, he had a long history of anti-Mobutu protests going back to the 1960s. The alliance also had became divided. 
Initially, the leadership of the AFDL was supposed to be collegial, with Kabila only being the spokesperson. But when he started calling himself the president of the alliance, other leaders are reported to have objected, especially Kisasengandu, who I spoke about earlier. Unfortunately for Kisasengandu, Kabila felt threatened by him and so consolidated his power base by organizing Kisasengandu's assassination. It is said that this assassination displeased the Kadogos and this might have been the reason why they eventually assassinated Kabila in 2001. Meanwhile, with the end of the Cold War in the 1990s, Mobutu had lost so much of the Western financial support that they had provided in return for his intervention in the affairs of Zaire's neighbors. Marginalized by the new multi-party system in Zaire as well as EU health, Mobutu finally relinquished control of the government in May of 1997 to Laurent Kabila and his forces. Mobutu died in exile a short time later. When the AFDL forces took control of Kinshasa on 17 May 1997, they were initially met with an enthusiastic welcome. Kabila would go on to be sworn in as the president of the newly renamed Democratic Republic of the Congo on the 31st of May 1997 and officially commenced his term as president. However, after perhaps one of the shortest honeymoons any victorious revolutionary leader has enjoyed, Kabila found his policies being challenged and his association with his foreign supporters, especially the Rwandan government, being viewed with suspicion. During his presidency, Kabila also went on to suspend the constitution. Some people saw him as a new breed of leadership, while others saw him as a continuation of the authoritarianism and corruption that he was supposedly replacing. Kabila wouldn't allow people to form the political parties that they wanted to form, and the elections that he had promised for April of 1999 became a distant dream. Kabila retained power to throw into prison those who dared to demand that he fulfill his promises, and he used this power very often. He also placed his leading opponent, Etienne Chizikedi, under house arrest. However, in May of 1998, Kabila authorized a legislative assembly. During this supposed period of political liberalization, his opponents continued to be arrested. So it came as no surprise when in August of 1998, some of the groups in the Eastern Congo that helped place Kabila in power began to oppose him and began a rebellion against his government, accusing it of numerous human rights abuses, including large-scale massacres of civilians, as well as the president's apparent favoritism towards his own ethnic group for political posts. Furthermore, his former national allies, Uganda and Rwanda, began supporting these rebels after Kabila's forces invaded both Uganda and Rwanda in pursuit of guerrilla fighters. Kabila, however, found new allies in Angola, Zimbabwe and Namibia, all of whom sent troops into the Congo in order to support Kabila's repression. All of this was the genesis of the Second Congo War, which devastated the country with its effect still being felt across the DRC. For Laurent Desiree Kabila, his survival skills served him well in exile, but deserted him once he had moved into the presidential palace. Rather, Kabila's Kadogos, that I mentioned earlier, were the ones that pulled the trigger that led to their boss's death. It is said that the Kadogos believed that Kabila had betrayed them. Kabila had believed that the Kadogos who had served him loyally since his rebellion in 1997 against Mobutu were utterly loyal. He even told a visiting foreign businessman that, and I quote, They will never do anything against me. They have been with me since the beginning. They are my children. However, he overestimated their loyalty. Some of the Kadogos that had marched in support of Kabila in 1997 had never pardoned him for killing their former leader, Kisasengandu. One of them is quoted saying, I marched with Kabila, but I knew he was a traitor. So the plot to kill Kabila started in early January of 2001, when a dissident group of the Kadogos went to Brazzaville in the Republic of Congo and drew up a document setting out Operation Bongo Zero. Bongo is a Swahili word for buffalo 
a reference to Kabila's physical stature. It is said that the plan was that the conspirators would infiltrate strategic positions in Kinshasa, the capital of the DRC, including the presidential palace, the national radio and television station, and the headquarters of the country's electricity company. The whole plot involved some 75 members of Kabila's bodyguards at the presidential palace, many of whom were arrested after the killing. Of course, there was a hidden force supporting them, but there are many theories as to whom that may have been. The day before Kabila's assassination, he had witnessed the execution of 47 Kadogos, all believed to have been plotting against him. So here is a version of the events that transpired on that fateful night of 16 January 2001. It is said that Kabila's young killer entered the president's office at the Marble Palace in Kinshasa as the increasingly paranoid and isolated Kabila was discussing with an economics advisor about a looming summit with France. The assassin bent over Kabila and the president, assuming the teenager wanted to talk to him, leaned towards him. The Kadogo then produced a revolver and shot the president four times and then escaped with other conspirators while the palace resounded with gunfire. At least three of those involved in the plot, including the unnamed killer himself, fled Kinshasa and may have gone into hiding in Brazzaville, the capital of the neighboring Congo. Two days later, Congolese officials announced Kabila's death. Afterwards, his son, Joseph Kabila, then aged 28, became the next president of the country. After the events of that fateful night on the 16th of January 2001, a former aide to the late Congolese president Kabila, Colonel Eddie Kapend, was sentenced to death for killing the president. Although Kabila had been shot by his bodyguard, two of his senior officials, Eddie Kapend, whom I have mentioned, and George's letter were implicated in Kabila's killing. Colonel Eddie Kapend had been Laurent Kabila's right-hand man as well as the chief of staff of the army. Eddie Kapend and George's letter were found guilty of, of having been the mastermind of the assassination of Kabila along with several other members of the late president's security team. 20 years later, in January of 2021, the men convicted of the assassination of Kabila were pardoned by the current president of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Felix Chisekedi. However, the case of who exactly was behind Kabila's killing hasn't been resolved. Let me know in the comment section below about the versions of Kabila's killing that you may have heard or read about. Don't forget to like and share the video if you enjoyed it. Thank you all for tuning in. This has been Tatenda for African Biographics. Until next time, cheers. Have a good one.